Hello friends, welcome back to the SNW YouTube channel. This is video 1, part 2 of the SNW BFA01 project, and in this video we will discuss measuring audio amplifier specifications using LT Spice. In this video, we will discuss the purpose of simulation, go over my simulation setup, where I'll discuss why I use LT Spice. I'll walk you through my setup and comment on simulation best practices. Then I'll do a demonstration. And finally, I'll show you planned future setup improvements. So let's first discuss the purpose of simulation. Simulation is a design tool, and its purpose is to help predict the behavior of your amplifier before you build it. More so, it allows you to test ideas quickly and cost effectively since you don't have to physically build them. Finally, Simulation enables design sharing for collaborative design efforts. As a result, simulation is a very important part of the design toolkit. Now let's take a look at my setup. First off, my preferred simulation software is LT Spice, and that's where I built my simulation setup. I particularly like LT Spice for three reasons. First, it has the largest DIY community. Therefore, it has plenty of learning material and tutorials. It is well supported by analog devices and linear tech, and there are many readily available designs for you to test out and model libraries to use. Second, the interface of LT Spice is relatively straightforward, which allows you to ramp up quickly. I actually became fairly competent at LT Spice, or at least I was able to get my way around things, in about two days. Finally, LT Spice is free and readily available. All you have to do is just download it. And on top of being free, it's actually pretty good. The performance of the simulation is actually fairly accurate. So for audio amplifiers, this, actually, this simulator is actually more than what we need. The picture below shows the top level of my LT Spice setup. Currently, it is rigged to test the DIY audio Honey Badger amplifier. The setup consists of four sections. One, the device under test. 2. Peripheral circuitry, 3. Spice global variables, 4. Stimuli and Spice directives. The device under test and the peripheral circuitry is the virtual hardware of the setup. It consists of the amplifier being tested and the circuitry that is connected to the amplifier. In this case, I have the load, the power supplies, and a measurement aid. Notice that the load and the supplies are actually parameterized. That is, the values are not hard-coded in the symbol. The values of the load and the supplies are actually coded in a single location, which is where I establish the global variables of the circuit. Also, on the bottom left corner of the figure, I have a voltage source labeled coupler. This voltage source allows or enables the coupling of the different stimuli sources to the input of the amplifier. Global variables include simulation options, tolerances, and circuit parameters. Simulation options control how the simulator behaves. For example, option num digit equal 15 forces the simulator to store variable data in double precision. Tolerances control the accuracy of the simulation results. Tighter tolerances will give you more accurate results, but will also slow down the simulation and may affect convergence. Circuit parameters set values for sources and parameters in the simulation directives. In the previous peripheral circuitry, we had everything parameterized. Here, with circuit parameters, we set the value of those parameters. For example, you can see I'm setting our load to be 8 ohms and the supply voltage to be 60 volts. Stimuli and spice directives include all the input sources and simulation commands used to exercise the circuit. Stimuli sources are voltage sources and current sources that connect to the amplifier through the coupler voltage source or directly. The source type depends on the simulation being run. The setup includes DC sources for DC sweeps and loop gain tests, AC sources for frequency response and noise analysis, sine wave source for distortion measurement, a small pulse source for stability tests, large pulse source for slew and overdrive tests. Spice directives are commands that prime the simulator before the simulation is run. These directives include stimuli source parameters, 
simulation sweep commands, and measurement commands. As a best practice, I try to parameterize as much as possible. This way, when I make a change in one location, it is replicated across the circuit. Now let's jump to LTSpice and do some hands-on simulation and measurements. Okay guys, so now I've switched from PowerPoint to LTSpice, and here what you see is the same setup that I showed in the slides. Let me just zoom in to the top. And the way I'm going to do this, first I'm just going to go over the setup again uh, in a little bit more detail. I'll talk a little bit about the Honey Badger amplifier, which is the device under test, and then we'll do some simulation. Okay, so first let's go over the setup uh, just to cover maybe a little bit more details that I didn't cover while I was doing the slides. So, as I said, the amplifier that we're testing here is the Honey Badger amplifier from the DIY Audio Forum store. This amplifier was designed by Peter Ostripper, also known, well, actually, his name is Peter Vogel, and he goes by Ostripper. The amplifier version is version 2.4, I believe this is the latest. And I picked up the schematic from the forum. So here is the device under test. Here on the side, we've got the peripheral circuitry, which includes the load, the supplies, and my measurement aid. Let me just discuss a little bit about what this measurement aid is. So basically what it is, is a voltage control voltage source. And the gain of this source is one over the gain of the amplifier. So what it does, it normalizes the output voltage of the amplifier back to the input voltage in terms of amplitude. And that is very helpful because it essentially is referring to input the output voltage, which in measurements such as noise and uh, distortion is actually quite helpful. Here's the coupler circuit that I mentioned before. I use this essentially as a quick way to select which stimuli I want to apply. So for example, if I want to pick this voltage source, what I would do is change the label here from V in zero to V in one, and they're connected. And we'll, we'll see that once we do the demo. Here are the simulation variables and options that I use. Option dot wind size equals zero eliminates compression, and this is very helpful for distortion analysis. Options num digits equal 15, tells LTSpice to store variable data as a double precision. For tolerances, I use tighter RELTOL at one micro. I believe the standard is one milli. I've actually observed that this gives me better results. I've also tightened AppStall by a factor of 10. I think this is overkill. I don't know. I don't think this has done much for me. Regarding parameters, I put in this section parameters that are going to be used by both the peripheral circuitry and the stimuli, which is at the bottom of the setup. So I have things like the load resistor equals 8, the supply voltage equals 60, which set up this resistor and these voltage sources, and also the gain, which in this case, uh, I know I have it as a formula, but it works out to about 40. That's actually used by my measurement aid, and some of the uh, voltage sources are used in the stimuli. Also, one thing that is a best practice, in my opinion, is actually to draw your setup in a hierarchical way. So you can see I have the, all the tests and periphery circuitry up in the top level, but then the device under test, the Honey Badger amplifier, is encapsulated in its own symbol. So I can actually go ahead and double click. The Honey Badger amplifier. This is almost the original schematic. I just made a couple changes to make it suitable to my test environment. Things that I've done is remove all the sources. So the arena schematic had a sort, the input sources like down here, and it had the supply sources. And I also removed the load. So there was a load resistor hanging from V out. Actually, I've taken those sources and the load resistor to the top level schematic. Uh, also, I've inserted my loop gain probe. It's a small box here that is used to measure loop gain of the amplifier. We'll talk more about that when I discuss about loop gain. I'm actually going to do a whole dedicated video on this little box, which is, in my opinion, very important and very useful. Big picture of this, of this amplifier. It's a two-stage amplifier, MPN input stage loaded with a current mirror. Emitter follower common emitter, second stage or voltage amplification stage using PMPs. 
current source load for the second stage and tail current for the input stage. Both of them are BBE-based current sources. BBE multiplier that creates uh, the bias voltage for a type 2 emitter follower stage, uh, three output pairs, which I think is appropriate for a 150 watt amplifier. The power supply, well, actually not possible, but the supply lines are filtered doing two ohms on 220 microfarad capacitance. And it has LED dials here to tell you when the supplies are up. So fairly standard amplifier. Uh, it has all the techniques that are known for THD reduction. So it's a perfect candidate to get us started. Now that we've walked through more or less how the setup is arranged, let's go ahead and do our first simulation. So I want to do uh, DC. So for DC, you don't want any inputs to your amplifier. Essentially, you want the input grounded just to get your operating point and be able to see what are the different currents in each of the devices and what are the voltage at all the nodes. For that, I'm going to tie the input of the amplifier through my coupler to this voltage source, V1. So this top row is DC and also loop gain analysis. So here you can see it's already tied. And actually, you can actually highlight this. You can right click and then highlight net. It tells you that it's connected. So our input is grounded right now. For the directive for a DC, it's just dot op, where actually dot op stands for operating point. And that's pretty much all you need. So to get this running, you would just right click and go run. So then the simulator does cranks and then it gives you this output where it tells you essentially the voltage at every single node and the current at every single device. I actually find this way of reporting particularly annoying. I find it difficult to read because for the most part, I don't know what node 005 and node 029 is. So this representation is actually not that useful. Maybe the top ones, I mean, I know VCC 60, V out is 645 microvolts. Okay, that's the offset of the amplifier. So probably the usefulness of this ends right there. A much better way, and this is actually built into LT Spice. So if we go, let's say here to the amplifier, and we hover our cursor over the line at the bottom of the page, sorry, of the window, it will tell you what the DC voltage is. So you can see it says right there, V, V out is equal to 645 microvolts. And also, if you put your mouse cursor on top of a device, it will tell you its power dissipation. So right now, the dot is dissipating 72.89 watts. Also, if you go into the schematic and put your mouse on the terminal of a device, so for some of this case, Q2, and I put it right on the collector, it will actually tell me the current. It says right there, IC XT Q2, which is the device we're looking at, is running at 1.37 milliamps. So this is much better way to go ahead and probe your schematic to see what the voltage current, the voltages and the currents are. Another way, and this is actually if you are more of a visual person, I like to use the a step by one degree temperature technique. I have this command here called dot step temp. And what this does is going to run the DC simulation at two temperatures, 27, 28, and it's going to just take one degree point between the two. Because I don't want to do too many simulations, I just want two. And let's let's do that. And I'll show you what this does. I think it's a neat trick. So I just commented this out. So now the simulator, when I tell it to run, is going to do the simulation twice. So now we actually have our plot window up. So if I click, say, the output of the amplifier, now it plots. So now I can actually read the offset. But on top of that, I also know now the direction of the drift. So this gives me one more piece of information. I know that the amplifier has 645 microvolts of offset. We already knew that from the previous simulation. But I know it's also drifting down. This is actually good for to confirm operation to some extent because you in there are many areas of the circuit where you know in which direction the voltage should be drifting 
And if it doesn't drift in that direction, you already know you got a problem. Let me give you an example. So here, let's say this voltage here, which is the voltage of the current source. I know this node here, that's one BVE above the supply. And I know BVEs shrink with temperature. So this voltage should actually be going down. So let's just plot it. And let's go click. And it does. That voltage is actually going down. So it does what it's supposed to do. Okay, so let's go back to the setup. The other thing I use this top row is to do loop gain. Loop gain is a little bit more involved and I do, I'm not going to go in depth in this video because I'm going to do another video just for that simulation because it's a little bit complicated. But let me just demonstrate it. So let me comment back this out because I don't need to do it at two temperatures. Then I need to uncomment this one. It has to do with the internals of that uh, loop gain probe. And then for loop gain, what you're going to do is it's an AC analysis. We're sweeping over frequency. So then the simulation command is this one. And what this is telling is we'll do a sweep of frequency and it start at one hertz and stop at a hundred megahertz. Now let's just run it. One thing that LT Spice does, which I think is very neat, it allows you to save plots. So for loop gain, I actually have saved in my computer how my plot ought to look. So let me just load it up. So for that, you click on the plot window, go plot settings, open plot settings file. It's called this LGS, which stands for loop gain single. And there you go. The way I have it arranged is so that the magnitude is on the top and the base on the bottom. I also have a uh, measurement commands. So one thing that is nice about LT Spice, and I think it's actually in Spice in general, there's this command called .mes, and that allows you to extract a result out of a plot. So the top one is measuring base margin, and the bottom one is measuring gain margin. And what this is doing is, is trying is finding a specific point in this curves and it's reporting them back. To view the results, you have to look at the error file. For me, I changed my hotkeys. So for me, actually, my hotkey is V, but I think it's different for the standard LT Spice. I actually encourage you guys to change your hotkeys. The predefined hotkeys are terrible. So here's the log file. Let me just scroll down. Here it is. So for face margin, the amplifier is running at actually 91 degrees. Minus 89 is actually the face, so actually face margin is 180 minus the face. And for gain margin, it's running at 13.6 dB. Maybe these numbers might not mean much to you right now. We'll learn more about this when we talk about feedback. But actually, this amplifier is really stable. Okay, so that's looking. Let's say we want to do now frequency response. So that will be now we're moving to the second row. So in that case, I would change V in zero to V in one. So now this coupler is connected to the second source. And I'm going to comment this one back because we don't need this. This is the statements for looking. And it's true, in AC, we're going to also do an AC. But for AC analysis, I have the range slightly different. In AC analysis, I start at 0.1 hertz rather than 1 hertz. And that's because I want to see that low frequency behavior when we're doing the frequency response. Now we need to activate this source. And I also have my own, my measurement to give me what the frequency, what the bandwidth is automatically. So it reports it. So now that's that. So let me just run it. And we can look at V out. And there is, so we can see that this amplifier in the low end starts rolling off at around two Hertz, roughly. I think it's actually exactly 1.6 Hertz, if you look it up. The DC gain is about 32 dB. And then the bandwidth on the higher end starts rolling off at around 200 kilohertz or so. To get exact, the actual, the best way to do it is using cursors. So you just click on V out. And then that will actually make the cursor appear. And then you can just drag it and read the values on the bottom window. 
So in this case, the GC gain, you can see it is 32.09 dB, which translates to about 40. The minus 3 dB on the lower end is about one, about two hertz, roughly. And then on the higher end is about 250 kilohertz. Because I don't like to be doing this all the time, it starts to get old. What I do is actually, that's why I have this measurement command to measure the AC bandwidth. And to view the results, just bring up the error file. Okay, it is right here. It's actually giving us the lower end. So minus three dB at 1.4 Hertz. If we want to see the higher end, we actually have to change a little bit the simulation parameters because the way it's doing it is scanning. So starting here, hit minus three dB and it's reporting the low end. So to look at the higher end, all I have to do is just start the simulation at a higher frequency. So if we go here and then start rather than 0.1, Say so started at 10 hertz, and then we will run it again. And now we've masked the bottom side, the low frequency side, and we do we look at the at the file. We can see that the bandwidth now on the higher side is 254 kilohertz. So one improvement that I want to do is actually not have to do this, have a way for the simulator to tell me both sides without having to do two simulations. Uh, for noise, if you want to test noise, noise has its own uh, command. So, and that's uh, noise V out, this line right here. And the way noise works is you have to use the noise command, tell it at which node you want to measure the noise and what is the frequency range of the measurement. So let me just, uncomment that. So actually I'm going to show you something uh, which I think is interesting. So what happens if you have two directives in the simulation, right? What will happen, let me just run this, this window will come up and LD Spice is going to tell you, hey, you're telling me to do two things, which one you want. So you just select the one you want and what LT Spice will do is comment automatically the one that you haven't selected. So just look at it right here. This will become commented. So, okay, you see? It just did it right there automatically. So that's nice. So, for noise, we can look at the output. Actually, I chose V out normalize to be the output. So, not the output of the amplifier, but the normalized output. And I like that because that automatically refers the noise of the amplifier back to the input, which is actually the spec. So, go there. So this amplifier is running at around six nanovolts per root hertz, a spectral noise. And if you want to know what the integrated noise is, this is, a, this is a neat trick. You just press control and then click on this variable here, the output noise. And LT Spice calculates it for you right there. So total RMS noise is 3.7 microvolts per root hertz. And then you can take that and calculate your SNR. Another way to do, get that integrated noise is you can do a measurement command, that's, which is right here. It says, me, so it's measure the variable you want to, in which you want to store the results, the integral of V output noise. And we can see the results here by looking again at the output file. And it's right there. It's 3.73 microvolts, which is exactly the same as what we saw by doing the control clicking on the V output noise variable on the plot. So it's a bit overkill, but some people like to look it on the on the plot. Some people like to look it on the file. So it serves both purposes. Another thing you can do with this setup, we can measure damping factor. So let's do that. So to measure damping factor, you actually need to look at what's the output impedance of the amplifier. So let's connect the input to ground again. So I'm gonna go back to V in zero. So input's grounded. And I'm going to inject a small current into the output of the amplifier, which is right here. Then, we need our AC because damping factor is an over frequency uh, measurement. And I'm not going to comment this out. I'm just going to do the other trick where I just select it from the little window. So now that we've done that, let's just run. So I want the AC. 
Okay, so now we can look at that's at V out, which is right there. So that's because we're injecting a current into the output of the amplifier. Uh, what we're seeing here is actually the output impedance of the amplifier. But we know damping factor is actually the ratio of the output impedance of the amplifier to the speaker load. So let's just do that plot. Okay, so let me just delete this. This is not useful. To plot it, we can do, we know it's 8 ohms for our output. We know the impedance of the amplifier, the output impedance of the amplifier right now stored in the variable V out. So go like that. And that's it. Phase is not important, so I'm just going to delete it. And I know damping factor is usually reported in as a number, not in dB. So I'm going to change this to only logarithmic. There we go. So at 20 kilohertz, let me just get the cursor up. At 20 kilohertz, our amplifier is doing 41. But one thing I, I mentioned is that damping factor is kind of a funny measurement because really what you're measuring is the output impedance of the inductor. So let me go into the schematic of the honey badger. And let's actually plot the damping factor internal. So V out is after the output inductor. Let's see what's actually the damping factor on the other side, the real output of the amplifier. So to plot that, we let's add a trace. So it's, again, it's 8 ohms divided by V. And now it's actually one level into a hierarchy. So it's XT colon V out. Oh, that didn't work. Why not? Oh, so it's V out I, sorry. So we can see actually the internal one is like way bigger. You can, at 20 kilohertz itself, this one's running at 40. This one, in the internal damping factor is running above 100,000. So that's why I, I, think I find damping factor a funny measurement, really. All you're doing really is measuring the, the ratio of the output inductor impedance to the load. It has nothing to do with the amplifier itself. But anyway, it is what it is. So let's move on. Distortion. I'm just going to do a quick demo of this one. I'm going to do a dedicated video on the distortion measurement because it's actually kind of a finicky uh, measurement and it requires some foundational knowledge on how this works. Uh, let me just put up, let me just ground that. And we're going to connect the input to V in 2. V3 is a sine wave source, which is what you want to apply when you're doing a distortion measurement. The amplitude and the frequency are parameterized. Here are all the parameters. Notice that I actually put these parameters here in this row and not here on the top. And the reason is because these parameters only apply to the distortion measurement. So now let me just run it. The rest here is a, it's a bit complicated, but we'll talk about that later in a future video. So I'm combining the transient. So what this is doing is, is running a time simulation. So let's just go ahead and run it. So again, just pick trend. And this one is a slow simulation, so I'm just gonna accelerate the video, so I don't need to bore you with this. Okay, simulation is done. So we can look at the output, which would be a sine wave. So once you have the output sine wave up, you can do two things. You can look at the FFT. So let's go right click to view FFT and then click on V out. Okay. And there it is. Those are the harmonics of this amplifier. Doing the FFT on V out, what I don't like is that the reference is not at zero. So it's, it's just a little bit difficult to see. So here is where, again, my measuring aid comes handy. So we can do, again, right click, view FFT, and let's do V out norm. Ah, so this, this I think is better. So you see the reference is at zero dB. So I know the second harmonic and the third harmonic are the second harmonic sitting at 95 dB below the reference and the third harmonic is sitting at minus 88.7 dB below the reference. So there, here's another reason why I like to have that measurement aid in the peripheral circuitry. 
And when you do distortion, there's a little command called dot four, which stands for Fourier transform. And what this does is it tells you what the distortion of the amplifier is in THD. So to view it, just press V, or actually I press V to get my log file up, and you get this. You've probably seen this a lot on people who do amplifiers. This is this table is what people like to report. So in this case, we can see a total harmonic distortion is 0.0046% at 20 kilohertz input. And I'm actually running it at maximum power. You can see that when we look at the output waveform. Just right there. See, it's almost 50 volts. This actually is 150 watts. So this amplifier is pretty good. 0.0046% at full power 20 kilohertz. That's actually quite impressive. And if you remember the numbers of the MC152 from Macintosh, this actually rivals it. So, small step. This is for stability purposes. So let's just do a quick simulation of that. So let me just change the input source to the small step. Here is a transient. This one is, I haven't parameterized it because I don't see much value on it. The frequency of audio amplifiers is typically restricted. So the pulse response of amplifiers doesn't really change much in terms of the time basis where you need to run it. The amplitudes are parameterized because what I want to do is I want the pulse at the output to be from minus 100 millivolts to 100 millivolts. So the input needs to be scaled down by the gain. So when the pulse is amplified at the output, I get something that goes from minus 100 to 100. So again, let's just run it. Try this one. Okay. And this is actually a fairly quick simulation, so, so I think it's done. You can see it right there. So it goes 100 to 200 millivolts. The reason it's not symmetric is because of the AC coupling of the amplifier. If it was DC coupled, this would start from minus 100 to 100. One thing that is worth noting here is how damped is the rise of the pulse and the fall of the pulse. There's no ring whatsoever. So this amplifier, again, is very stable. And we already knew that from the loop gain, but it's always a good best practice to verify it with a small pulse response. Finally, we can do a large pulse response. I'm gonna keep the plot window up. So what I'm gonna do now is just change this to be in four, which is this one. And this source is heavily parameterized. I think it's overkill, but I just did it. And you can see I actually use a piecewise linear source rather than a pulse source. And the way that works is you feed the source with parameters that go in pairs. One is the value and one is the time. So the piecewise linear source here, it starts at a value of zero times zero. Then after a delay, it's also at zero. And that's when it's going to start rising. Then at LP delay plus rise, it goes to the magnitude of the step. So in this case, it's one volt. Then after the delay and the hold time at the top, it still stays at the, at the one volt, but it's about to start going down. And then at the delay plus the hold plus the rise time, which is the same as the fall time, it goes back down to zero and then so forth. You can actually read this and it's fairly straightforward. So now it's connected and let's run. And there it is, zero to 40 volts, back to zero to minus 40 volts to zero. Again, very clean rice, no ring, very nice large pulse response. No, no funnies, this is a very well behaved amplifier. Uh, we could actually measure the slew rate if we wanted to. So, we could just zoom in into here. And this is actually a beautiful manual process. So I'm just gonna do a very rough calculation. I'm not gonna go crazy. Uh, so we can go one, and then we can do the second cursor. And now we have the second cursor and it's right there. And now the 
the nice thing of this tells you this low, which is 20, will be 21 times 10 to the 6, which translates to, uh, well, 21.8. So it's 21.8 volts per microsecond. Best industry practice for slow rate is actually do 10% to 90%. And that would mean for 40 volts, so 10% is 4, uh, sorry, yeah, 10% is 4 and 90% would be 36. So, yeah, I know, not exactly because I did 5 to 35, but close enough. Okay, so that's it. That's all I have for my setup and just going over it. I know it's been a bit long, but I wanted to go through the whole thing. If you have any questions, just put them in the comments or shoot me an email and I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so now that we've gone over the setup and done a quick demo, future changes or improvements that I want to do is have transient power supplies so that they actually encapsulate the ripple of the unregulated power supply and see how that affects distortion. Once I have that, I'll demonstrate it. Probably have it once we start designing the power supply. And if you have any suggestions on how to improve the setup or what I should add, please let me know. Uh, write it on the comment section or uh, just shoot me an email. Finally, I wanted to comment and summarize the best practices and tips that we just discussed on the demonstration section of the video. First, on the best practices, always do hierarchical design. This will enable you to reuse a setup and be able to switch different designs and components under test fairly quickly. Also, use parameterized sources, never hard code. This will allow you to make changes in a single location in the circuit that will ripple through the whole thing. Regarding tips, when doing a DC simulation, consider sweeping the temperature by one degree. This will allow you to plot the DC voltage and current that you're interested in, and also will show you the incremental drift of this variable. Finally, consider changing your hotkeys in the simulator. For some reason, LTSpice likes to use the function keys for hotkeys. I find this unintuitive and difficult to remember. So just assign them to something that is more convenient or easier to remember. For example, if you want to put text, you could assign that to the letter T. If you want to view the error file, you can assign that to the letter V for view. Let's look at what's coming in our next video. So in the first video, we covered the amplifier specifications and what are the project goals for the amplifier we're designing. And then on the practical side, I did a demonstration of my setup and some tips and tricks on LT Spice. On the next video, we'll go over the frequency response and power requirements of the amplifier. And we'll do a design of the input network. We'll decide what the voltage of the power rails should be and what should be the voltage gain for the amplifier. And I'll show you my thought process on how I actually select all these values. If you like the content of this video, please make sure to subscribe to support the channel. Also, if you are subscribed, you'll be notified when the next video is up. See you in the next video, and bye now.